Hey, what's up, guys? Uh, the few of you who are here right off the bat, thank you for coming. And hey, how's it going? Happy Tuesday. Let's get right to work on the MO night. Uh, but hey, Ryan, hey, so nice to see you there in the chat. Yes, birthday. It is my birthday. So as I've mentioned in the lead up to this live stream, it's my birthday. And that's why I'm building what I want to build for this birthday stream. I know that, um, you know, live building a Gundam or basically anything else is sure to get, uh, I mean, a lot more views, a lot of people just watch for Gundam, right? But uh, I'm building what I want to build, which is the Emo Knight today. So uh, I've never built one. This is the smart gun equipment type. I did my unboxing video a few days ago. Um, Hopefully you guys are interested in that. Oh, I meant to grab Lincoln's book. Uh, let me grab that. It's over here before I started. Um, where is that? It's right there. I was looking for it on the shelf, looking for a white spine, because I know the, the cover of the book is white, but I, yeah, I forgot the spine is red. Anyway, yes. So shout out to Lincoln for the awesome book. I don't think that he'll be joining any point during the stream. Uh, if he stops by to say hi, uh, that would be awesome. I know it's super early in the morning Australia time, but then again, he does wake up really early. So I don't know. Um, but thank you guys all for the birthday messages there. Spidobaka, uh, Spidobaka, I don't know, Signarli, uh, Mercenary, Sturgetti, let's see, all of you guys, Ray, Rerum, Liam, yes, thank you all. Uh, yeah, so uh, the Mark 44, as I mentioned, if you watched the unboxing video the other day, I think I mentioned in the video. And I know I've talked about before in my review of this book. So basically, if you've seen anything, any time where I've ever mentioned anything about the Mark 44, uh, I've said that it's not been one of my favorite designs. I thought it was just very uh, kind of overly clunky looking. And I mean, that's kind of like sort of a theme of like the retro sci-fi theme of Machine and Krieger as a whole, even though this is, again, technically not Machine and Krieger uh, sort of, but um yeah, the Mark 44 never really did much for me, but you know, after checking out Lincoln's book, after kind of looking at it more and more, I and just kind of, I enjoy everything else Machine and Krieger that I build. I, I thought, like, I'm sure I'm going to enjoy it if I just try it. Uh, and so that's where we're at. And now that I've actually, you know, got one in hand, of course, I'm excited to, to build it. So um, just like as another shout out here before I put this to the side, awesome book. From Lincoln, if you guys are at all interested in you know Machining Krieger or in Lincoln's work, uh, I can highly, highly recommend this book. It's definitely worth the price. It's expensive for a book. It's like fifty dollars, I think, uh, is what we have it for um, here at USA Gundam Store. But um, just, I mean, keep in mind it was, was all like independently published and all done by Lincoln, and it goes to a good cause. Please buy it if you're at all interested and you've not bought it. I can recommend it. Um, if you don't live in the U.S., you can get it from Lincoln directly. Um, even if you do live in the U.S., you can get it from Lincoln directly, but it'll probably be cheaper if you buy it through U.S. Gundam Store. I know that we have a couple left, but I know not that many. Anyway, uh, as for the kit itself, I'm not sure, actually, if we have any. Now, I believe we don't have any of this one. I think last I checked, I think we had a couple of other different ones, but I don't know um, if you're looking for the kit. Uh, but I know that I believe we should be getting some more of this, as well as some, some other... Um, I was talking with Adam the other day. There's a good amount of Machine Krieger stuff that we have like on order on the way from both Wave and Hasegawa. So if you guys are all interested, I know we got some uh, on the way. Um, right. So uh, Ryan's got to go to work. Okay. That's, I understand. Thanks for stopping by and saying hi, Ryan. Uh, Mushinen said the Mark 44 does look more cumbersome than something like the Fireball for sure. Yeah, exactly. The, well, that was uh, my thinking, why it didn't appeal to me earlier on. But so 
I'm going to do something a little bit different with the build of this. Normally, I would just follow the instructions step by step. Um, but what I want to do uh, slightly differently in this case is to um, put together the parts that are going to require a seam line removal first. So that those are just glued. That'll give us uh, some more time uh, to let the glue dry. I'm definitely not going to finish the model today in one sitting by any means. I don't have any of the parts cut out or anything. It's all still on the runner. So, um, but just so that the stuff that needs to be glued is glued, so that I don't need to like draw out the build anymore. We'll just get everything that needs to be glued done first, and then everything else kind of we can just add on to that as we're going along. So. Just taking a look through the manual, um, I don't have uh, I don't have a highlighter anywhere. Um, or yeah, I do. Never mind. Sorry. So one thing which hang on, let me see. I thought I did. Uh, hmm. Where did I put that? I thought I had a highlighter that I do quite frequently when I'm uh, working on machine Krieger builds is a lot of times you'll have a spot where you're kind of you're building a section like take for instance this part right here which you guys can't see uh, here uh, which is kind of like the you know face mask part for lack of a better word uh, and like say these clear parts this is a really good example uh, these clear parts here uh, when I'm going through the build, you know, the, the first time through, just kind of putting everything together, if I don't want to put those clear parts on right at that time, I'll just highlight them here in the manual so that I can remember to go back and add them in later. And I can remember, like, kind of where everything was meant to go. I thought, I swear I had a highlighter here. I think I took it home. Um... Doo -doo 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 -doo. If not in that drawer, I had like a cup. Uh, oh, there it is. Yeah. Yes. I had a cup with some different markers and stuff in it. Um, and actually, unfortunately, no highlighter, but that'll work. So as we're going along, if there's if I'm building this section, but not adding one or two particular parts on quite yet, I'll just circle that or highlight it or something just to remember to come back to it later. But uh, thank you guys, Red5, uh, Kieran, Travis, thank you guys for the birthday wishes. Uh, I'm not sure how, I think, I believe that's Russian or I'm not sure what language, so I'm not sure how to read that name. Sorry, it looks like Anik something, but apologies. Uh, if you could let me know how to read that name or just what to call you, that'd be useful. But they're on the YouTube chat um, asking if this kit requires glue. Yes, so these kits absolutely do require glue. Um, I guess... E yes, the short answer is yes, they require glue. A lot of the kits, I mean, a lot of these kits, I've not built this particular one yet, so I, I can't say for sure, but uh, a lot of the stuff is snap it but like then a lot of the smaller detail parts and things like that you are gonna have to glue or at least i would highly recommend gluing or you have to glue anyway yeah so let's see okay this is d hmm? okay so let's get into it what can be better after a long day of work to see a master at work working his way to perfection? Well, thank you. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go that far, but uh, I appreciate the comment anyway. So, um, look, just taking a quick glance through the manual, it doesn't look like there's going to be a whole lot of seam line removal, seam lines uh, for this kit. Let's see. Couple parts here in the legs. So we'll take a look at these. We'll go ahead and glue these up. These sections, which are for, sorry. These sections, which are for the leg parts, which, ah, 
turn off my walkie talkie. Uh, the in like the leg parts of like where the pilot's legs go inside the what would be kind of the mecha legs or the suit part of the legs. Let me fold this a bit so it's kind of easier to deal with. Set that up there for us. And it's these parts here. And some polycaps. So they do also have some polycaps. I saw somebody asked in the chat. Um, let's see, Limbo asked if this is by Wave or Hasegawa. This is by Hasegawa, which is kind of interesting in that the way then that the uh, suit type kits like the SAFS and different other suits are typically made by wave um and hasagawa usually makes like the ship type things like um uh or like the larger uh larger larger kits sort of um like the um Dachshund, the grocer hunt those type of ones uh, those like ai units and um like the new spotter, the Krakenvogel, those, um, the Luna Diver, uh, the Falke, these type ones are usually made by Hasegawa, but this one is a suit type one that's made by Hasegawa. So it is a little bit unique in that sense. Uh, I want to also grab a sending stick. Uh, might as well use just use a new one, which I believe are in a drawer here. Uh, happy birthday, Daddy O. Thank you, Demon Slayer. Uh, how's Florida life been? I just moved down here myself back in August. Oh, um, yeah, fine. Uh, it's been a lot to adjust to for sure, and I can't. I can't say that I love it. Not necessarily like just Florida life, but um, just life in America in general. But just to be entirely honest with you guys, I don't love it. Uh, I definitely prefer Korea. <laughs> but uh, when it comes, like the reason we moved, the main reason we moved, uh, and by far the most important reason that we moved was for our kids. So, I mean, I just try to keep that in mind. Um, it's definitely not bad living here. If I had to choose between the two, like if it wasn't for my kids and if I just had to choose, uh, I would prefer uh, Korea. But um, yeah, there's a lot to adjust to. You know, I lived abroad for 11 years. So, you know, coming back, it's a big change. It was a big change going over, but I feel like when I moved to Korea first, I had just graduated college. And I mean, when you're that age, I, I was 22, I guess, you're very malleable. <laughs> you can very easily adapt and change. You know, I didn't have a wife. I didn't have kids. I don't have these other responsibilities that I need to consider. I'm just me by myself. And you can go and you can just adapt pretty easily to that kind of environment. I feel like I could anyway. I, I, I guess I shouldn't say that easily because I know um, a lot of people don't a lot of people maybe can't it is a, a big change but it was easy enough for me it's much more it's been much more difficult moving back uh, just because you know I'm at a different point in my life uh, kids wife job that I'm in everything's different so yeah um, one thing about this, so you'll notice that for these parts uh, that I'm gluing right now, I'm not removing the, the nubs on them. I For these parts, I'll usually do that. I might like cut the nub down a little bit, but when it's just something like this that I'm just gluing to just get rid of the seam line on, a, especially a machine career kit like this, uh, I'll usually not remove the nub marks ahead of time. I'll just glue it with the nub marks because then sometimes what you can do is if you remove the nub marks, especially on a curved part like this, uh, ahead of time, you may cut down a little bit too much. So then once it's glued, there'll be a little bit of an indent on one side of the seam and not on the other side. And then that's something that you'll either, either have to like over sand or fill in with putty or something later. It's easier just to 
keep it as intact as possible ahead of time, glue it, and then your sanding of the, of the seam will at the same time remove the nubs. And so it's just kind of saving you a step, a step or two or three steps ultimately in the process, uh, I feel like. So uh, are you at the warehouse? Yes. So I am, is that uh, good enough in focus? There we go. I am at the warehouse. That is where my office is. Yes. Mm -hmm. Happy birthday. Bizophone, happy birthday to a fellow February bro. Happy birthday to you as well. I assume that your birthday was earlier in February. It's certainly not going to be later unless you're a leap year baby. And interesting note that I almost was a leap year baby. I was born on a leap year. Uh, but I was fortunate in that I missed it by a day. But could have been. I had a kind of friend growing up who was born on leap year and, you know, doesn't necessarily make too much of a material difference in their life, but, you know, it is, it's something unique anyway. So I'm going to give that a good amount of glue. And this part actually um, is a, when the kit is completely all built up, this part is fairly hidden. So you really don't need to put too much effort into the removal of this seam, I feel like, but, you know, I like to make the build as clean as possible at the start. And then that gives you, I feel like, more room to, to change it. I don't know. It's sort of like, well, I don't know. I guess I'm kind of like thinking back against myself a little bit. But it gives you more... Uh, kind of leeway to do what you want with it if you start with a very clean canvas, I feel like, if that makes sense. But then again, not necessarily, so I don't know. Okay. Uh, what type of nippers are you using? I really need new ones. So these are just the uh, USA Gunham Store nippers. I mean, obviously, I use them because I work here, but, I mean, they work really well. So that that's what works for me. Uh, We'll set those off to the side. Next, we also need other parts for the leg. So then like the kind of outer part of the leg, which would be kind of like the lower leg. Does the thigh part have seams? No, there is no thigh armor, right? The thigh, the there is no thigh armor. Anyway, so you need 18 and 19 off the D runner, a couple of parts that go inside. So we will kind of do a little bit of prep type work on those because those are going to be solid inside there. And then B, which I think is not that one. Here we are, runner B. So leg one would be 13 and 14. There's the parts for one leg, and next leg I'll cut these out now, but then set them to the side so I don't get any parts confused. So those up there for a second. Uh, hey, birthday, Jiku, thank you. Uh, do you use sprugu? Are, if you're referring to like uh, cutting up sprues, uh, like runners, cutting up parts of the runner and then mixing it with uh, Tamiya Thin Cement, like this, in order to make like plastic putty, essentially. Uh, if that's what you're referring to, then no, I don't usually make that. I think I have made that maybe once in my entire life. Um, yeah, I don't know, not for any particular reason. I just haven't had a need for it, I guess. But especially on a kit like this, normally any machine career kit that I've built, which I mean, uh, I mean, my experience with machine career kits is fairly limited uh, still. But any kit that I've built, I haven't really had too much trouble with the seams, as in, like, 
needing to do a bunch of extra work on the seams. And that is sort of due in part to the fact that like the, the way that the kits are built and the kind of like the way that they're like quote unquote meant to be finished is to, you know, have a little bit more of kind of a weathered uh, look to them. You don't of course necessarily have to do that, but that is kind of like the style and that style lends itself really well to, you know, a build that is not quite as so pristine. So you don't really need to worry so much about like making sure everything's super perfect on the build. That said, I do still like to, like this part here, for example, probably don't need to sand any of this because it's gonna all be kind of locked into the leg, but just as, um, just kind of more out of habit really, to be honest, uh, sanding stuff, just because I know that once this part is in there, it's gonna be in there until it's painted and so just to make sure that it's basically paint ready. Just doing a little bit of sanding on these parts. And so the, uh, if you're wondering what I'm using to sand, this is from Wave, one of the Wave uh, soft type sanding sticks. I believe this would be a 600 grit one. That's uh, far and away my favorite to use. Uh, because if you're using a fresh new one, that 600 grit is pretty good uh, at you know, clearing away the material, but polycaps. Um, if, once you use it for a while and it's kind of getting more dull, uh, then you can use a kind of more well-worn one uh, as more of like a finishing sanding stick. Or even though it started as 600, then it's, it's kind of more along the lines of like an 800 or something like that at that point. Let's see, B. Oh. Oh. And around 800, in my experience, is usually good enough. Uh, to paint. That's only if you like really want a, a super duper pristine finish that you would need anything more than than 800. But you know. Okay, so this part goes in there in the back and this part goes in the front. There. Um, gonna wanna glue that, but I'm just making sure if there's anything else that I wanna sand before this all gets glued together permanently. So this is gonna be on here like that. So these are kind of like the inner details of this part. And I think before I do that, I'm gonna leave those parts out for a second and just kind of sand a little bit this edge. Uh, just because I don't want any uh, sharp edges, which would basically be kind of your mold line when your mold line is right along the edge of the part. I don't want any of that. And I could sand this just as well once those parts are in place, but I kind of might as well do it a little bit ahead of time. And I can do it more later too if I need, but just so that's all nice and crispy. Well, not crispy actually in this case. Uh, let me go ahead and throw some glue on those parts while they're while this is opened up. Quick question, do you ever get bored of Gumpla, even if it's just a little bit? Yeah, sure. Uh, that's one of the reasons why I like building kits like this from time to time. Uh, like last week, uh, I built like four of the HDI, not HDIBO, um, four of the HG, which were Mercury kits, just like in a row, just boom, 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 in the, over the course of like 
a day and a half. And yeah, after that, I was like, I need to build something else uh, just for a little change of pace. And that's why I built up the uh, Lunagans, which if you saw my post earlier today uh, regarding this live stream, I had the Lunagans there also in that photo. That's what I've built up over the last kind of few days just at home, on my at home build. And yeah, it's just been as a kind of palette cleanser build, just kind of, yeah, something just to kind of have something different. Yeah, it's sort of out of boredom, but just, mm, it's, I don't know. I guess that, yeah, sure. I guess that'd be the best way to describe it. Yeah. Seeing that hand painting with lacquers is popular with machine career kits. Any recommendation for uh, hand painting? I've found that I tend to smear primer off sometimes. Yeah. Um, yes, that happens. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how, like anytime I've seen uh, Lincoln or Max Watanabe or Koyokuyama san, like the kind of masters of that hand painting style, anytime I see them doing it, I never see them uh, pulling the pulling the primer is basically what you're talking about. I'm very familiar uh, with that happening in my own builds. Yeah, um, that does happen. And because basically what you're doing is because you're using, because you're hand painting with the paint kind of thinned down a little bit as in it's got some, some thinner added in. Uh, and usually you want to use like the, uh, Either the Gaia notes, I think it's like Brush Master, Brush Master, I think it's called, or uh, Mr. Hobby um, leveling thinner. It's thinner that has a little bit slower drying time, basically, to give you more opportunity to not have like brush strokes and stuff in your hand painting. Anyway, uh, yeah, when you're painting that on, that's basically reactivating the primer, and you can sort of like, as you're painting on the paint, it's gonna like start to reactivate the primer and then like pull that with your paint as well. So yeah, I totally get what you mean. It happens to me. Uh, you kind of just, I feel like I, I've gotten better at it and it's the, the kind of thing you just kind of uh, get better at with time. You just kind of have to have a good sense uh, of kind of how thin you need to have the paints, how you need to actually brush the paint, I mean, there's there's like, there's a certain feel to it. I mean, it's not just brush it on there. They make it look really, really easy. Uh, Lincoln and Max and Yokoyama-san. Uh, but I mean, there is definitely, there's a certain touch to it that it takes practice to get used to. And I feel like I'm kind of starting to get a little bit better at it, but I mean, I still have yeah, definitely a long way to go before I would ever be able to make it look as easy as they do. But yeah, it happens. Mm -hmm. And actually, I'm not sure those of you guys who may also follow some of Lincoln's content, I'm not sure if like I've ever heard him really talk too much about it. It'd be interesting uh, to ask him about it. Uh, just because, you know, I'm sure it's something that, you know, in kind of developing and becoming, you know, good at those techniques, I'm sure it's something that they've dealt with as well. Um, but yeah, uh, less retouching of areas is a good way to reduce that, but it's a lot of practice. Yep. Um, yeah, that's the thing too is, well, I mean, cause yeah, sometimes when you see like those guys doing it, their paint looks pretty thin, <laughs> but, uh, it kind of, you know, it needs to be thin enough, but yeah, it just needs to not be carrying too much thinner in the paint that you're gonna be reactivating the primer too much. Yeah, it's a it's a difficult balance. Just kind of takes practice. It's kind of like um, when you first are st starting to getting into airbrushing and uh, like um, eyeballing the thinner ratio. Some people measure it super carefully every time. I certainly don't. Uh, but like being able to tell just by looking at the paint, if it's thin enough or not enough, just by, you know, adding how much thinner, you know, basically is going to need for so much paint and just being able to kind of eyeball that it's similar like that, you know, eventually over time, you just kind of 
get an eye for it uh, just through practice. And I feel like it's the same thing. Uh, so the ratio, so should the ratio not be one to one? Um, as far as like the ratio, yeah, I mean, like, as I was just saying, that's the kind of thing I'm not sure. Mm. It depends on the paint. I would say number one and number two. Um, yeah, it really just kind of depends on the paint and I would have to see it against, I'm sorry to say, not something that I ever really am too careful about. Um, switching ahead then here to the next part, which needs to be glued, is part of this kind of drum just on the back side. Not exactly sure what it is. In the manual, it just says body rear. Mr. Getty may know in the chat. This part here at the back side goes like that. This is going to be a pain. Any part like this, which has like a, a bunch of detail running through it, like all this, this bit is much more complicated to get rid of the seam line nicely. But I have a feeling that this is the kind of part that is probably going to be also, again, like mostly hidden. So I probably don't need to worry about it too much. But again, we'll, we'll try our best with it just in case, because I'd rather have it nice and clean uh, than having to try to clean it up later or than having uh, an unsightly seam anywhere. So it should be pretty straightforward, though. There's some details that we're going to need to work around, but nothing too bad. Uh, I'm dying to try airbrushing, Mr. Bobobo said. Do you have a favorite brand of paints? Um, well, no, I don't have a favorite, but definitely the one that I've used mostly has been Mr. Color lacquer paints, um, mostly just because um, they are good paints and easily available. They were easily available. They're pretty easily available here in the U.S. as well. Uh, not too bad, but certainly in Korea, where I was living previously. I mean, they're very inexpensive, easy to get. Um, so, yeah. Uh, oh, my goodness. So, as I close this up here real quick. I never said thank you for the super chat. Oh my gosh, sorry. <laughs> Bizaphone, sorry. Thank you so much, Bizaphone, for the super chat. Get yourself a cold birthday drink. Thank you. I actually had something prepared for that just in case uh, that we came to this. Your super chat is actually going to the Dia Come Home Fund. <laughs> so I was thinking, let me just write that on here. That's a CA is Canadian dollars, right? Hey Siri, what's five Canadian dollars in US dollars? Five Canadian okay. dollars is three dollars and sixty-seven cents. <laughs> kind of a weird number, but anyway, thank you. Uh, and so yeah, one thing that I thought I wanted to do, and this happens to me every time. Uh, this happens to me every time when there's so it's Genshin Impact. In case you guys, that's what this. Well, Diaz is the new Genshin Impact character. Uh, it's currently like the only game that I play, so by default, my favorite game at the moment that I'm playing. <laughs> uh, the new character, and every time there's an update, I always think that like I know when like the current there's like the countdown of how much time is left on the current banner, and I'm always thinking like uh, as soon as that countdown's done, then the new banner is going to be available right after that, and I always forget that then there's like some there's like two periods of time in between before the new action before, before the new banner actually starts that there's just a, a brief period of time where there's just no uh, like 
other banner other than the standard banner. And then there's the maintenance time where like you can't play the game at all for like four or five hours while they're doing the maintenance for the update. So as usual, I forgot about that time in between. And I was thinking like uh, the current banner is ending. I think uh, it just ended like an hour ago or something. I was thinking that during the live stream, uh, we can do some pulls for Dia uh, because I was thinking, yeah, that banner is going to end. We'll have the new Dia banner. I can do some pulls live on stream because uh, I have like 40 pulls saved up, which is not that much and probably not going to be enough. Uh, and I'm also up against the 50-50, but I thought we could do some pulls live on stream. But uh, yeah, actually, I forgot that. Yeah, the new banner is not actually starting until like later tonight. So unfortunately, can't do that. But Bizophon, thank you. Your fund uh, will be going to the Dia Come Home Fund. <laughs> so yes. Uh, so I appreciate that. Uh, and or to a cold drink. Yes. Oh, which reminds me. I was going to have some... I have some sake here in my refrigerator that I was going to have during this stream, but I actually think I may not just because I'm kind of feeling okay now, but kind of had like a, a headache over the past couple of days kind of coming and going. So I don't really feel like I want to drink any sake at the moment. Like a beer might be good if I had a beer, but I don't have any. So, <sighs> oh, well. Not prepared. I have water, which is probably for the best. Uh, I don't know. Sunday, I just felt terrible. Like Sunday afternoon. I don't know what hit me. I think it's because I didn't have any coffee. And I I hate to admit that because I think I'm at the point where like if I don't have coffee, I have like the withdrawal headache, the caffeine withdrawal headache. Yeah, it's caffeine addiction, uh, definitely. And, you know, I hate that, but... I don't know. Unfortunately, I think that's what it was. And so like Sunday afternoon, I hadn't, I didn't have any coffee on Sunday. It's like from the afternoon, I just like started feeling like no energy. My energy just dropped like a rock <laughs> and it was just bad, super tired. And um, yeah. And then like in the evening I, I had like a headache and um yeah, and then even yesterday. And then I didn't like I didn't sleep very well. And then last night also I didn't sleep very well. It's like having trouble falling asleep. And then I kind of like I started to fall asleep and then I started having a dream, you know, where you have a dream where you're like starting dreaming before you're like super like actually fully asleep. I was having one of those and I was having a bad dream about a snake in my house, two snakes in my house actually. And so like I immediately woke up from that. And then like I couldn't fall back asleep because then I'm like thinking about snakes in my house. I don't have like a a snake fear, but it was just kind of one of those things that like it's late at night. And for whatever reason, I don't know, I just couldn't fall back asleep. And I'm thinking about like, oh, now that I'm like thinking about it, it's totally possible. Like here living in Florida, what if a snake was in my house? Like, what would I do? What if I, you know, was trying to catch the snake and like just get it outside what if i got bit and then like we'd have to go to the hospital and there luckily where we live there's a, a er like quite nearby so just like five minutes up the road um but even still anyway so i couldn't fall back asleep so anyway i didn't sleep well last night and so i still feel like i'm all right right now because i did have coffee today uh, but i feel like probably drinking some sake even just like a small amount i don't really want to do that right now maybe when i get home or something later in the evening but like right now in these lights and i'm talking to you guys probably not a good idea uh hire a cat who'll handle that yeah 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 maybe i could get a cat that's true uh Way too much coffee also gives headaches. Yeah, that's true. Sure. Um, I feel like my tolerance, though, is like already way up there that too much coffee is probably not even a, a thing for me at this point, unfortunately. But yeah, I take your point. 
Uh, all right, a couple parts here for the arms also need gluing, and then that's basically it uh, for anything that needs to be glued. So we can finally be done with this stage. And as I was saying before, if you guys are coming in later, um, this is not how I normally go about building these kits. I would normally just go through the manual like normal and just kind of build it step by step uh, as it goes in the manual. But because uh, I'm just wanting to do it a little bit different this time, I'm going through the manual and finding which parts need to be glued uh, as in like for seam line removal first, gluing those, and then we'll go back and kind of work our way through the rest of the manual. This part, interestingly, needs to be kind of glued inside another part that needs to be glued, but I think not necessarily. It's like the wrist joint. Uh, roll, uh, roll said, and hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly, happy birthday. How can I find out if and when Wave or Hasegawa are bringing out uh, a new machine career kit? Is there a good news site for that? Yeah, there's different sites, but probably like uh, following both of them on Twitter would be a good way to know. Uh, or like any uh, like Japanese store, any like online uh, shop like based in Japan would probably be a good bet. Um, because we do get them here in the US and different stores um, get them. I know the um, when new cut when new kits come out, we do get them here at USA Gundam Store, for example. But I don't believe we usually don't like put them up for pre order or like have anything uh, about the kits like when they're first announced. It would be the kind of thing that like when we get them, we put them up on the website uh, for people to buy. But other than that, yeah. But I mean, if you're asking, then I assume that you already know that what happens with a lot of machine Krieger kits is that um, once they're announced and what, once they're available for pre-order, they do tend to sell out uh, because they're not produced in super massive quantities. And so, and then, yeah, once they're sold out, they're kind of harder to get and more expensive and all that. So, um, yeah. It is a good idea to pre-order whenever possible uh, or, you know, get them straight away. If you, if you know when they're coming out, so that you can order straight away, yeah. Um, but I mean, as far as knowing about when new ones are announced, I know that there's different websites, and I just can't think of, I just can't think of anything off the top of my head. Um, even like uh, Facebook pages, like Supreme Mecca, I don't believe normally post about new Machine Krieger kits. Uh, let's see. Uh, Jui was saying about coffee. I'm just, I'm like behind in the chat a bit, but I'm just trying to catch up a little bit as to what you guys were saying. Two cups a day for me always. He said, I normally do one cup a day, but it's like one big cup and quite strong coffee. Uh, so I'll, that's what I do. Um, and that usually takes me, like, and I drink quite slowly. So it'll take me like, half a day. I'll just be drinking on that like throughout about half the day and then that's good. For me, Sabita Baka said, I finally kicked energy drinks and the withdrawals were the worst. Yeah, that would be tough. Uh, I've never I've never gotten into energy drinks but I can certainly imagine. I mean like and this is what was weird to me that I've had days before when I haven't had coffee and I was kind of mostly okay. So I don't know why on Sunday it was especially bad. I think it's because we also went outside and we weren't like out in the hot sun a lot or like all day by any means, but we were out in the sun for a little bit and like walking around outside. And I think just being like out in the hot sun, maybe exasperated that a little bit. I'm not sure. But maybe. Okay. Downsides of Florida. Yeah, there you go. I'll watch out for Python. See, a Python, it wouldn't bother me because, like, I know that even if it did get pissed off and bite me, it would hurt, but, you know, I could deal with that kind of. 
it's uh you know venomous snakes obviously i'm much more worried about and especially here in florida i'm not familiar enough yet to know which ones would be venomous or not so like but if it's a python i would be able to i would know it's a python and i would be fine that wouldn't bother me at all uh just think about australians they have it way worse yeah that's true uh for painting do we disassemble the kit uh if we add plot plates for details um if you're talking about for painting these uh it kind of depends on the kit how much disassembly you want to do for it and it really just kind of depends on what it depends on what the kit is it depends on what you do what you want to do with it what your plan is for the kit um generally if you're talking about like the quote unquote official unofficial style of machining career kits they're typically not really disassembled too much before you do your assembly and that um, you're going to leave the kit mostly all put together. So you can kind of go through, actually here, let me put this together and I'll show you an example. Um, let me see. Let me just grab my Lunagans behind me. So here is the Lunagans, which I have finished all the assembly on this. Probably easier to show you up here on this camera. Ding, -ding, -ding like that. Uh, so it's all put together and mostly all glued. So I'm not going to, even if I wanted to, I wouldn't be able to take most of this kit apart. Uh, but I can paint it. I can at least do the priming in like certain sections. So like uh, the bottom and the legs can come off so I can have like this bottom section which also also has the engine in the back that's like one section each leg so that'd be three parts and then this top part the kind of middle section of the body can be another part and then like the head can be another part so I can basically break this down into five sections uh, at the very least for priming and then when it comes to painting uh, it may be less than that. I may like uh, may then leave it as like four, three or four sections, something like that, uh, when it comes to actually painting it. So where's the, the did I miss a part? Where's uh, there's those and this? I think I forgot. Okay, yeah, I did. Somehow, missed cutting these off. Um, yeah, typically you're going to leave most of the kit assembled if you're going about like the way that they're sort of officially uh, made. But again, you don't have to make them any particular style. But yeah, normally, you know, most of the painted machine career kits that you would see online or anything uh, that you would see like from uh, Koyoko Amasan, Max, Lincoln, kind of like be the, the biggest names in these type of kits. Um, just like to name a few. And I think probably most people uh, who are into machine and Krieger modeling, yes, would leave most of the kit mostly assembled. If you wanted to airbrush it, I'm not entirely sure how much disassembly they would do. Uh, because uh, in preparation for building this kit, I was re-watching Lincoln's video of um, weathering this kit. So he has a, a YouTube video. And I think it was originally uploaded as like a few different videos. And then he uploaded it as uh, a single video. I was re-watching that about weathering this kit. But I wanted to see uh, how he painted it. And I thought that he did a video on painting on, on the white knight, I should say. I thought that he did a video on painting the white knight, um, but I couldn't find this. So I think I need to look again um, because how he painted the white knight I know was by airbrush and not by hand. And I thought that, that the painting style and the weathering style that he did for the white knight, I thought would actually be kind of cool to recreate something basically along those lines for the Lunagans. So I thought uh, I wanted to check kind of 
uh, generally, I mean, like, I get the gist of how uh, how the kit is airbrushed, but I just kind of wanted to see exactly kind of how much he broke it down and kind of how he painted the the detail inner details versus the uh, uh, outer armor sections, things like that. Just kind of how it was all broken down for painting, kind of. because again, and I'm sure Lincoln would say the same thing. And that just because, you know, I'm interested to see how he did it. That doesn't mean that like that's the, the best way or the only way by any means of doing it, uh, but it's just a way. And so, you know, just seeing it done in, in that particular way um, might be uh, in some way sort of instructive uh, to me. So it could be useful just to kind of see how he did it. And then I don't necessarily have to do it the same way, but yeah, you know what I mean? Hmm. So there's this part here, which is for, okay. Uh -huh. For the wrist joint, this also needs to be glued but I don't think that I need to worry so much about the seam line on this because it's going to be inside the forearm, essentially. Let me see. Uh, Wave doesn't have international distribution, so the shipping cost from Japan is to the stores at the price, yeah. Um, yep, yep, yep. Sorry, I'm going to try to get a little bit caught up there. Uh, Sturgeti, on, on that, on your comment there about the guns, yeah, I, I really love the design of the Luna guns as well. Uh, it's, it's such a cool design, so I was very excited to build that one. One of the reasons is I love that middle section, which is kind of basically that's kind of what makes it what it is, is that middle section with like the fuel tanks and the big rocket boosters on it. It's one of the things that makes it what it is, and it's really cool. And I think that, anyway, so just to go back to what I was saying, the uh, the way that Lincoln painted the White Knight, uh, I think that that actually might fit quite well for the Lunagans, but I think that a little bit more camo would be good for that. So rather than it being like completely pure white like that, having it being like a, a two-tone camo of like almost pure white and then like a very light gray. I think that, I mean, that makes sense for the, for the lunar combat as well, right? And actually, hmm, if we take a look at that, let me just get the glue on here real quick. Actually, Chase, thank you for the birthday wishes there. Um, taking a look at the camo card. What the fuck? Oh, it just fell down. Something just fell down. Uh, taking a look at the camo card here. Uh, like this color scheme. Actually, I think this is the one that's on the box art, right? Uh, yeah, this one here, but this one's kind of similar and kind of more to the point that I wanted to say. Typically how it goes is that like your camo like this, the darker color is on top and the lighter color is on the bottom. But if it's made, well, I don't know. If it's made like for lunar combat, it might be kind of interesting to do it in reverse to have the darker color on the bottom and the lighter color on the top. Because if it's supposed to kind of blend into the lunar surface on the tops of things is where you would get like the brighter uh, highlights from the sunlight reflection on it. And then like you would have the darker shadows below. So if it's like gonna blend in with the lunar surface, I would feel like having the lighter part on the top and the darker parts underneath kind of makes a bit more sense, right? Um, what do you guys think? I mean, 
I think that could be kind of cool. And it's sort of unconventional in terms of like the color placement for camo on a machining career kit. So I like the fact that, I mean, I'm not going to paint this kit like right now, tomorrow, but like pretty soon, hopefully. Uh, doing it a little bit differently like that, I think could be kind of cool. What do you guys think? Uh, not well versed in machine career lore, but have there been new designs released uh, lately? Um, well, the completely new, I don't think so. I don't know what would be the newest, uh, the newest one that's like a completely new kit because most of the kits that come out are kind of variants of other kits. So I'm not sure. Sturgetti would be a better one to ask than that. Uh, Fun to build and paint up that very engine mechanical section. Yes, yeah. Um, Lambo asking, have I ever done a collab with Mecha Guy Kotsu? Um, I've not. I've never actually even talked to him at all. So I don't know. I've never made the effort, and neither has he. So there you go. Um, so these wrist sections that I just glued need to then go into the forearm there, and it looks like that. Is really not going to show, but I'm going to wait. I'm going to put that off to the side for right now. Um, and let's see what I will do. So I want to be able to, even though it's barely going to be visible, if at all, that little ball section right there, which is the, the wrist joint, I want to be able to send that seam a little bit before put, putting it inside here. And that's not going to be possible at the moment just because that glue is still drying. So I'm going to set this section off to the side and then I'll have to glue the seam for this forearm section later, which is fine. But one thing that I will do now, just so that this part doesn't get lost anywhere along the way is I'll just go ahead and glue this little joint piece in here connection piece really just so he doesn't get lost anywhere that's gonna have to go in there anyway if that's just inside doesn't really need to be glued but just for right now that's fine okay and with that, that's everything. Those parts that you see there is all that really needs to be glued as far as any seam lines for the kit, which is pretty minimal, which is nice. Uh, may have kind of seemed like a lot, I guess, but compared to a lot of other kits, like if you if ever built like one of the grocer huns or any of the variants of the grocer huns, it probably has easily double that in terms of like the number of parts that need to be glued. So that's not too bad. All right. Then let's go back all the way back to the beginning of the manual, which actually starts from the feet, which is always, I always kind of enjoy uh, builds that start from the feet because it sort of feels like you're kind of building the robot from the ground up. In this case, the suit from the ground up, but I always enjoy feeling that the uh, real grades uh, often tend to follow that kind of order as well. Uh, I don't know of anything that's wholly uniquely new. That's plastic uh, from Art by Co. Uh, could be missing, but like I said, it's just variants. Yeah, so I mean, to answer your question as far as like new designs, yeah, it's mostly variants. Um, I'm trying to think, though. I feel like there's something that was previously... It must just be one of the variants. I feel like there was something that had previously only ever been available as like a resin garage kit like a long time ago and it was like an old one and then they finally made it as like an actual kit a plastic model kit recently but i can't think of what it was mm. it'll come it's like maybe it was the kraken vogel maybe is what i'm thinking of or something like that or the camel maybe that's what it was is the camel maybe the, like one of the newer ones Camel might be one of the newest ones. Is that right? I feel like uh, that was one that was a 
a resin garage kit that was um, when that came out as a plastic kit fairly recently that was the first time that was available as a plastic kit correct me if I'm wrong on that though uh, the Nyx used to be available okay that that one as well yeah uh, but it didn't have art as it's just the flage cockpit with a melusine body there's a, there's quite a few of those like the Altair I think was another one the Altair and then there's like the Lunar Lunar Hunt right it's the other fairly recent one um, that's uh, I mean like it's just basically a kit bash of other parts of parts from other kits See that 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 okay. Just all the parts for the feet here to put together. Like the lunar hund, if I remember correctly, it's basically like the Altair with the Dachshund's head, essentially. Something like that. So there you'll have that kind of thing where new kits a lot of times are just Kind of reworking the parts in different ways to make some other kind of different interesting variants. Which, I mean, it's all good and well. I don't mind it. And I feel like most uh, kind of Machining Krieger fans, like if, if that's what Bandai was doing with all their new Gumpla, I feel like people would certainly be up in arms about it and people would not appreciate that. But with it seems like a lot of Machining Krieger fans are just kind of... Uh, quite excited and happy about any new releases, even if it is something like that, that it's just like just parts from this kit and parts from this kit put together into one box. And now you have a new kit, even though there's nothing actually really new about it at all. At least for me, it's, I still like it. <laughs> I'm always excited. Anytime there's a new kit. Uh, let's see. Camel and Falke were both available as plastic from Hasegawa, I think. Okay, maybe it's just that the recent, like a more recent release of the Camel was just a, uh, it's a reissue. Is that what it was, maybe? Okay, I don't know. That's another one I'm definitely looking forward to. But it's another quite big one. It's one of the bigger ones. So uh, I would want to finish a couple other projects first before starting on that big boy. Uh, you should build the new wave uh, Melusine 120 kit. I have one or two. I probably bought two. I don't remember offhand, but yeah. Let's see. Actually, it might be... Yes. No, I think just one, actually, of that that I got. But I, I have it over there. So we're in the queue to be built. So I will. This one's kind of jumping the line just because we have the new version of the Mark 44 on the way soon. And I just wanted to. This one's jumping ahead of some other kind of recent releases. And then we have the uh, A8R8. Is that right? A A8R8. R8. A, uh, the newest kit that just came out. Uh, I've got one of those on the way as well. So it's a lot of other stuff to build. It's just that among everything else, it's hard because these are the kind of kits that, like, uh, with a, a Bandai Gundam kit or something, I can build it and you know show it in an interview, and then it's kind of served its purpose for the time being, and then I can kind of chuck it back in the box until, you know, one day when eventually, hopefully, I'll get a chance to paint it. Whereas with these kits, um, there's not really too much to show uh, for a review of them just, like, snap build out of the box just because they're not even... You can't even snap build them. I mean, sort of, really. This is pretty interesting. Uh, so this part here for the foot, to differentiate the front, or differentiate the left and right foot, you can see there's two little, might be a little bit difficult to see. Uh, let me actually turn this a little bit here. Down the brightness, don't want it to be too dark, but 
you can see right here, there's these two little short little pegs right there. And this interior part, whether you have this tilted to one side, locked into this peg on this side, or uh, to the other side, locked into that one, that is the differentiation between the left side and the right side uh, for this foot part, which is kind of interesting. So it should be that way. Here, let me just go ahead and glue that. And then, yeah, that's it. Because everything else, like this part is symmetrical, but it's this part that you put inside of there that makes it asymmetrical. It's pretty interesting. And then this part goes inside here. I'm really slopping on the glue just because uh, I'm building the Lunagans at home. My bottle of glue at home is like getting low. So like the brush barely reaches the glue. So I need to like slop a bunch of glue on there to get enough. But this bottle is much more full. So I keep forgetting that I don't actually need to get that much glue. Uh, the brush is holding plenty. But, all right, so. This, I know I'm going to want to do some more sanding on this part, but don't need to at the moment. So let's go ahead, glue this. It's nice to get something new because it's a new canvas to paint entirely differently, even though the parts are the same. Yeah, I mean, that's a good point. Um, right, I mean, you could just, I mean, with like a Gundam kit, if you got a Gundam kit and painted it one way, and then maybe say later on down the line, you had an idea of maybe how you might want to try that kit again and paint it a different way. Um, you can always get that same kit again, usually like with Gundam kits, whereas with machine career kits, um, you have to wait for a reprint that may come someday or may not. And, um, you know, rather than getting the same kit again to paint in a different way, yeah, you're getting almost the same kit with a new variant that comes out, which is essentially like a reissue. But now it's got new package design, a little bit different parts, and you know, a little just something a little bit different to enjoy about the kit. Um, so yeah, I, I totally agree. Uh, little engineering quirks that always get my brain rolling on kits. Yep. Uh, great kit. Hope to see you build it soon. This one? Or what do you mean? Just stopping in to say happy birthday and hope you're having fun. I am having fun. Thank you. And thank you for the birthday wishes. Um, yeah, building a kit like this, it's definitely a much slower process. It's not just, you know, slapping it together which is fun. That's one of the reasons why I love building Gumpla. You know, they just go together so quick and simply and they're fun to build. And even stuff like from Kotobukiya as well. Um, but I do like these kits because they really just kind of make you slow down a little bit and kind of spend a little bit more time uh, holding the parts, you know, connecting with the model, I guess, in an interesting way. You're spending more time with it, where I guess like obviously with, with Gumpla, you can certainly spend plenty of time on your kits. All right. Anyone here have any suggestions of your favorite paint brands to detail the vents, wires, thrusters? If you're talking about like for machine Krieger kits, a particular color. I mean, I know that uh, German gray is a 
pretty solid one, I feel like. Uh, but I'm not sure, actually. I don't know what the, well, I can look right here in the manual, at least on this gate anyway. Um, the interior parts, kind of the frame, I guess, parts as it were, the 116, black gray, RLM 66, black gray. But let's see. Yeah, so that's what the recommendation is for this particular kit. Which, you know, if that's what goes for this kit, it's probably what would be the standard for a lot of machine Krieger stuff, I guess, because, you know, what, what works on one would then kind of fit the aesthetic to work on other kits, I would imagine. Uh, detailing shouldn't really matter much. Um, brand, yeah, I mean, of course. Uh, yeah. I mean, that's something that I've always found interesting about these kits as well in that, and I've, like, I've actually talked with Lincoln about this uh, a couple times, I think probably more than he cared to talk about it, but uh, that like with Gumpla, we would paint like all the frame and basically anything that's like a part of the frame or a part of like the mechanical structure of the Gundam, we would paint in like our, you know, gray or gunmetal or whatever the color is for that. Whereas uh, with Machine Krieger, a lot of times the, those parts of the kit are just painted in the same color as the armor. As in it's just kind of all painted over and just like the same colors. And uh, I think it was on this particular kit on like the White Knight anyway, that I asked Lincoln about it uh, when I talked with him about his book. I was asking about it. Like I had noticed in some of these parts, I actually were at a good stopping point there after gluing those parts to the feet. I can actually show it to you. And my dad's there. Hey, dad. Thank you for the birthday wishes. Uh, let's take a look at Lincoln's White Knight. So let's see what would be a good example photo here. Let's look at that one. That's still a work in progress photo, but let's see. Um, um, Wait a minute. Wait a minute. That's not the right one. Here we are. Okay. Yeah. Here's what I wanted. And let's see. It's hard to show on camera, but okay. Um, can you see down here? Maybe up here. Anyway, you guys can still see what I'm... So up here in the bottom of the feet, like this is like mechanical detail, this kind of bit right here. And then you have this spring, whatever. Uh, for like someone who typically does Gumpla and uh, for like what is the norm for like uh, other mecha modeling, I feel like Gumpla and otherwise, this is a section that you would normally paint like in your frame color, which would be dark gray or, you know, gunmetal or whatever, like I said. But in this case, like he's painted all white and that's kind of a, a normal thing. It's not abnormal for a uh, machine Krieger to have it painted like that. And I, I asked Lincoln about that specifically, and he said that, yeah, um, for that, that kind of stuff, um, if you're just thinking about it realistically, there's not really any reason why that would be painted in a different color or unpainted or, or whatever. And especially if you look at like kind of the interior, he mentioned the, uh, the interior of like aircraft, or, like the interior of the bays, um, either like where ammunition or the um, uh, landing gear is stored and specifically because this is essentially landing gear right the feet on this where the landing gear is stored uh, in the aircraft a lot of that interior structure in there will be white or a light color and the reason for that is so that it's easier for them to see where dirt is so because those areas those areas need to be 
uh, especially clean. And so having that in a lighter color, uh, it's easier to keep those areas clean, which was really interesting. It makes a lot of sense. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I don't know how we got on the topic of that, but I think, yeah, somebody was asking about uh, painting details. So anyway, yeah, painting details, um, you do, like, typically do in Machine Krieger, but not necessarily in the same way or to the same degree that you do with, like, with a, with a Gundam kit or something, for example. So that's that. Let's move on with the feet. Um, okay, E. So a couple more E parts, and actually, that's D. Okay, have you ever built the White Knight? Uh, I would, if I could. No, so I've I've never built any other version, any version of the Mark Forty Four. So this is the first time. Um, but I do. Uh, also, I mean, I have the new version that's coming out, so uh, at least I'll be getting that one, and then also the Hammer Knight as well that I want to get and build up. Neither of which are going to be, like, tomorrow, but uh, no, the White Knight, I don't know if it, if I come across one or if I... If it gets reprinted or something like that, maybe. But. So there's our feet. And even though there's the left and the right, it is going to be, I feel like, a little bit difficult to tell which one's which. So there's going to be more sanding required on this. Normally, if I wasn't doing this live with you guys, I would sand this all kind of as I'm going along. But I'll save you guys the the even more so the boredom of watching me just sanding those parts. Uh, let's go ahead and put these, the rest of these feet parts here together. We can move on a little bit with the leg. Took a nap and woke up to like who's in the room, huh? Raycon said. Interesting. All right. As a person with a foot fetish, those feet do nothing for me. Yeah, as I was saying before, I like the start of the stream. Um, it's certainly a more clunky, and I think as somebody said in the chat, a cumbersome design, and especially with these big flat feet. They definitely fit the retro sci-fi aesthetic very, very much so. But yeah, as you know, someone like I, I do love that aesthetic, but I mean, as someone who also loves like the aesthetic of uh, Gumpla and other like mecha sci-fi, sci-fi mecha stuff, you know, that's certain like big and clunky and cumbersome designs is certainly not something that exists too much within the Gundam franchises. I mean, like the most notable example, I guess, that I could think of maybe be something like the GOG or something, for example. And even that like has its own kind of thing. The Zock, maybe. Maybe another one. This is well, I think I'll do some more sending on probably later on, but it's a little bit right now. Because this part is all going on the inside of there, actually. So a lot of this is not really going to be seen too much. And it has a poly cap. So I'm not going to glue this part in right now. So I can take this out and sand it some more later if I want to. Kind of interesting how it seems like I'm building like a a shoe to go inside of a shoe. All 
and then these parts. Uh, there's a 50 sci-fi uh, film called Gog, <laughs> and I'm wondering if that's where the MS got its name. That's uh, a good question. Yeah, I wonder. Uh, I do know the film that you're talking about. I don't, although I don't think that I've ever seen it. And I do love like retro classic sci-fi movies, like um, Forbidden Planet. It's one of my all-time, all, one of my all-time favorite movies. And Gog is kind of from uh, that similar kind of time period, right? What was the year that Gog came out? Actually, now that I, I think about it, I don't think that I've watched the movie. But yeah, I remember where I've seen. The movie is, I think they have it on Amazon Prime, I believe. So I'll have to watch that. Yeah, I don't think I've watched it yet. What year exactly did GOG come out? And I'm just kind of curious. I know uh, Forbidden Planet is 1956. Uh, I'm 100% sure that I know Gog is not going to be anywhere near as good as Forbidden Planet is, but I'm sure it'll be still interesting. Good watch. Let's see. Mid 50s. I could check right offhand, but 1954. So, yeah, it came out before Forbidden Planet. Forbidden Planet, uh, as I understand, I mean, obviously I wasn't around at the time, but mm. as I understand just from what I what I know of the film is that it marked quite a turning point in uh, science fiction film at the time. That before that, you know, most sci-fi films were kind of campy, cheesy uh, B-movies, really. And a uh, Forbidden Planet was like the first sci-fi movie that was kind of, you know, a much more kind of serious film film, which is very cool. And it's got Leslie Nielsen in a serious role, which is hilarious. Like the first time I ever watched that. Now I, I can watch the movie and just kind of separate like that Leslie Nielsen. But like before, like the first time I'd ever watched Forbidden Planet, all I'd ever seen Leslie Nielsen in was, of course, like his later comedy movies. So it was very difficult to to focus like on like taking him seriously uh, in that serious role in that movie. Just because it was so unusual for me. Uh, La Planet Sauvage is good. At, I'm pretty sure I have seen that. What's the English title? I mean... I guess it would just be... The Savage Planet, I guess, or something, but I believe I have seen that before. Okay. Four polycaps in this one little foot section. Interestingly, feels a bit overkill. kind of tricky to get these little ones in there. There we go. Oh. It's Forbidden Planet in the original French. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, there you go. Yes. I was thinking, that sounds familiar, though. Like, I don't know. Maybe that's why it sounds familiar, because I knew that it was, I've not, I didn't know it offhand, but, but I've seen it as the title of Forbidden Planet, but Maybe that's why it rang a bell to me. But I was thinking that it was something different, just reading that. 
There's that one shoe. But yeah, if you guys have never seen Forbidden Planet, I would highly recommend it. I even really enjoy watching, not all, but some of like, uh, sometimes watching like old Mystery Science Theater 3000 episodes, just because like it's funny because of the added commentary, of course, but then like the movies actually not have bad either. Like some of those old sci-fi movies that they're, um, that they're riffing on are actually like quite interesting movies sometimes, or at least interesting enough <laughs> to enjoy watching. So we got that and we got these. I did want to clean up these a little bit here. Let's go ahead and put this on a little bit of mold line. Even though this kit didn't have a whole lot of uh, seam lines, which is awesome. You're still going to have mold lines on different parts. And something like this little kind of piston part right here, it's cleaning up the mold line on a tiny little part like this, it's pretty inconsequential. But like I said before, I like to have it to be as clean as possible with like the original, with like the build. And then it just kind of feels more complete, I guess. when it comes to the painting. I cannot worry about like, oh, uh, as I'm in the middle of painting, I suddenly notice, oh wait, there's a like really ugly looking mold line right there. Having this all done ahead of time, then I can kind of know, all right, there's not gonna be any surprises along the way. They're gonna have to force me to kind of like backtrack and go back and have to sand another part again or something like that. All right. Just, I sanded that a little bit and then just kind of cleaning it up a bit with the knife. And could glue that, but it doesn't really need to be glued. It's just plugged into a poly cap. I may opt to glue that later, but for now I won't. It's just plugged in there and it's solid enough. And then this goes, fits into the shoe like that. And there's our two shoes, the bottom parts of the feet anyway. All right, Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla was a turning point for me. It combined Kaiju and Mecha, and it was superb. Yeah, that was a great one. Of course, I remember watching that as a kid. Uh, okay, we've got uh, the next section is dealing with these parts, which we already glued, uh, which the glue still needs to be dried and these still need to be sanded some more. That's actually like coming apart. That's not good. That's going to need some more putty on it. Let's see if I can add some more glue and kind of press this a little bit more. Not really. It's going to need some either putty or just some super glue probably more likely is what I'll add for that later. Some super glue. That one looks fine though. So anyway, skipping over that section for now, let's skip over the legs entirely and go to part B. Or Runner B, which is the hip section. Okay, that's a very kind of simple part here. Happy birthday, thank you, Blaze. Uh, how does these kits feel compared to Gumpla in terms of like the feel of the plastic, pretty similar. Um, yeah, pretty similar. It doesn't feel like cheap plastic or anything like that. Yeah. 
you won't have that kind of feeling. And you don't have, like, even though a lot of stuff needs to be glued, it's not like, it's not like the parts don't fit together properly. It's just that there's, it's just not made to be a snap fit kit. You know, it's, it's made with the intention that, you know, some stuff is going to have to be glued. So not like with, you know, some like third party kits or something like that. Sometimes that, you know, you just end up having to glue stuff because the, the fit is not quite right. Or, you know, it'd be a little bit too tight or a little bit too loose or one way or the other. That's not really what you're going to get with a kit like this. Okay. This one is PC, D, E, and E. Got a fair amount of polycaps in this, though. Even in places where it feels like it kind of doesn't really need to be polycaps, there is some. Like this one here for between the torso and the hip section. And even like where the legs plug in, I feel like kind of didn't really need to be any polycaps there, but. And this part, I'm sure, let's see, where is this going to plug in? Let me just check the manual. I'm sure this is not going to show at all. And so I really don't need to glue this other than just gluing it together. Um, yeah, it's really not, but might as well just put some glue on this. It'd be a really easy thing to just sand up later on. Oop. Way too much glue down there. Oopsies. Well, oh, yeah, we're going to send that anyway, so. Extra glue. Okay. Uh, let's see. Danzi said, I bought the HG Psycho Zaku and I'm so happy to build it. Yeah, that's a fun one. Um, I definitely prefer the MG, but the HG is cool. I like that they're not exactly the same. The HG and the MG Psycho Zaku are a little bit different. Uh, I like that about them because a lot of times, you know, that the MG version would just be you know, the exact same design, just you know, bigger whatever, but it's kind of nice in that case that they're a little bit more different, right? It's mostly just going to be a difference in armaments, but still. It's cool. All right, for our face mask, anything else from Renner B? Um, no. C, 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 D. D5, D6. Could be a good opportunity to try something a little different with these parts here, possibly, but I don't think so. Yeah, probably not. Oh, and we missed a part. Let's see. Uh, I wish the MG Psychozaku was the manga version, though. Mm, yes. Manga Novia. Yeah, I guess so. That's a good thing to point out. Yeah, the, the difference 
and the two kits comes from one's the manga version, one's the OVA version, right? Uh, good point. These are all parts now. Oh, the camera's frozen. How come you guys didn't tell me? Or you were telling me and just nobody noticed. Let's go ahead and do this. Hang on just a second. You guys will still be able to hear me, but bear with me for a moment. All right. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm gonna... Apparently OBS just likes to do that sometimes. Because uh, it still looks fine on my camera. But, alright. Just reopen this here. Can you bear with me for a moment? Actually, uh, in the meantime, well, it's back up. So, let me do this. Do that. Um, and we should be all right here in just a second. Um, yeah, I know, guys. Hang on. Just bear with me for just a moment. Let's see. You can go here like that. Hey, here I am. Um, I'm just figuring out why my camera is being kind of weird. Do this. Let's see if we can get this camera back. Cause this, there we go. Do do do. Here we are. Uh, uh. There we go. <sighs> Sorry about that. So yes, we're in the middle of working on these parts for like what is essentially the face mask here. And yeah. Uh oh. Interesting. Ooh, now what's doing something? Uh oh. So you guys can still hear me, which is good. I can still see that thing going on. Uh uh camera. FaceTime. Oh no, that's not working either. So here's what we're going to have to do is Hello. Hmm. Strange issue. I don't know why it's doing that, but yeah, I don't know. Sometimes it can be a bit strange. Hey, here I am. Okay, weird issue. Yes, I don't know. Sorry about that, guys. As we were saying, this is the face mask, which is you know probably like a weird, considering that it's a suit, it's kind of a weird thing, but you guys get what I mean, which part of the suit it is. Here now that at this point in the manual, if you're following the manual exactly, that the legs should be done at this point, the entire kind of lower body. And now this is starting on the kind of torso section of the suit. But you know, obviously our legs are not done yet. We're just kind of letting the glue do its thing on those. And then in the meantime, we don't need to wait. We can move along here to another section. Um, 
Okay. So anyway, everything's good now, right? Yeah, everything is visible. Okay. Um, this section, let's see. Should we cut out this part? Like, let me look at. The color card. This part is actually kind of meant to be cut out. So I'm going to cut it out. And for that, we are going to need to drill. Da -da -ding. What scale is this, uh, Mark? This is 120 scale. So starting off with a one millimeter drill, but I know I'm gonna need to go up probably to, uh, no, one, probably 1. 1.5 will be enough because that's actually right on the edge there. And I actually kind of F that up a little bit, but I already had a, issue last week of stabbing my finger with the drill. So hopefully cannot do that again, but not off to a good start at the moment. Let's see. Actually, you can probably just stick with the one millimeter drill, I think here. Just put a few holes and then we'll just kind of cut out in between. and try to avoid stabbing myself again in the meantime. Uh, what drill slash bits are those? Turns out the Harbor Freight ones aren't very good, Artemis said. Um, these are the Mr. Hobby. Uh, it's the Mr. Hobby pin vise set that if you've watched anything on my channel, you've probably seen me use before. So these are the Mr. Uh, these are the US Economic Store collaboration ones, uh, but you can get the just regular set. It's just a different color. The actual drills themselves are exactly the same. Um, but like if you're ordering through US Economic Store, I mean, that's, I think, what, uh, what we would have here. I have, I think it's at home. I have another set that's like the uh, regular original color version of that. And it's, they're like in just like multicolor, like yellow green, blue, red, something like that. Yeah, uh, but really, really super useful tool to have. So I can highly recommend it, having a set of these. And you can get other drill sets. Like before I got this set, um, what I used was one that has like a handle and just an interchangeable drill bit. So like anytime you want to switch to a different size, you have to take out the drill bit and, and swap it out. The nice thing about that is that you know you're not limited to what's included in the set. But the downside is that you know it's less convenient with this. I mean, when I want to change size, I just grab the one I need. Um, so you know, pros and cons between the two. And let's see. So what I did was just make some holes like that, and then I'm just going to use my knife to kind of pop out, cut out in between. It's not very scientific. But it will do the job. I'll try not to cut myself. I think like this probably be safer pressing down into the table instead of towards my finger, but there we go. starting to get there, but still needs a little bit more cleanup of this section. 
where did the part go that came out? I don't know. Gone. Just to have this uh, kind of eye slit right there, to have it actually completely empty rather than just like painting it a dark color to just actually cut it out. I feel like it's going to look a bit better. And I think I'm going to want to file this a little bit as well. Um, yeah. Oh, I don't know. Let's see. I think it'll be all right. Saku-chan, hello. Thanks for the thumbs up there of approval. Let's see. Let me just finish getting this cut out and then we can move on. Just want to make this look nice. Even though it's a pretty small detail. Just not going to make a like a huge noticeable difference. But in the details is where you're going to see something like this really come to life. So there's that. And let me just actually go cut this a little bit more. Try to make it as not noticeable as possible. And while we're here, just do kind of a little bit more sanding on this part as well. All right, uh, Chase says, what's your favorite UC series? And Mo asked, what are we building? Well, what we're building is in the title of the video. It's the Mark 44 Ammo Knight smart gun equipment type. Uh, my favorite UC series is probably either 8th MS Team or Unicorn. And then turn A if you count it as UC or not. Uh, you know, technically it would be UC. Super, super late UC, but yeah. Uh, if not counting turn A and just kind of focusing on what is kind of more traditional, um, you see Universal Century, uh, then yeah, eighth MS team or Unicorn. Now this goes on here. Which way? This way. So let's go ahead and sand this part a bit too before we start adding stuff onto it. I may want to also go in and add some texture on this as well. Some of the old classic um, putty texture may end up doing that as well. It's kind of a common feature to add to a Mark 44 and one that I may follow suit with on mine, on this one anyway, but not at the moment, anyway. It's always nice to see those little little sinks kind of along the edge and mold lines, things like that. It's always magical to see those disappear and to have a much nicer finish. Just with a little bit of sanding.
and kind of being quite uh, intentionally very random with the direction of the sanding on this, just because this uh, sanding stick is a little bit rough. And so it is probably going to affect slightly the way that the paint looks. So being a little bit um, kind of random in the directions that I'm sending kind of helps. That will help later, uh, I feel like, with how the paint will look. All right, so this part, we can go ahead and glue. Um, no, wait, sorry. <laughs> let me, let me finish. Uh, let me cut out this part here, drill out to be precise, but drill out this part before we glue that onto the front. Cause then it's just going to be more difficult to hold once more stuff is glued on before we glue anything on here. That's pretty easy handle. Uh, what's your favorite MS designs from Unicorn? That's a good question. There's so many to choose from. I mean, uh, there's so many to choose from. <laughs> there's a lot of regular ones. I mean, like from the Unicorn itself to, um, I mean, the the Banshee, the Phoenix, definitely my probably my you know, least favorite. But I mean, the Phoenix is still pretty cool. Um, then you have really great ones like the Shinanju is amazing. The Rosenzulu is amazing. Um, I'm going to need a file for that. Let's see. File box. Let's see. I think this one would be good. Um, a lot of the the grunts I didn't I used to not really care so much for the um, uh, for the resil, but that's grown on me quite a bit. There's a lot of like the silver bullet, and there's a lot of really great old suit designs in uh, unicorn. Probably one of the reasons why it's one of my favorite series is because it has so many great uh, what was it designs, and it has a lot of really uh, cool cameos of older designs, like some like uh, the uh, Zaku Sniper, for example. Like the the whole sequence with the Zaku Sniper is awesome. That's not like a, a new design. Specific to Gum Unicorn, although I'm not sure if you guys can uh, fact check me on this. That that's the first time that the Zaku the one sniper is in an anime. I know that like the design existed as like an MSV design, but I don't think it was ever animated until Gun Unicorn. Is that correct? Am I correct in that? Uh, these I just recently got some of these diamond files, and they're already very much coming in handy. Yeah, um, this is from Wave. So there's a bunch of different ones that you can get, all sorts of different shapes, uh, where the end to be just a slightly different uh, shape. Diamond file, very, very handy for exactly for this type of situation where you have kind of a little bit kind of hard to reach area. So really, really nice. The trick is to know like, you don't know ahead of time what exact ones you're going to need. And there's, yeah, there's like 20 different ones that they make. So I, I picked up a couple of them that I thought were ones that looked like they would be especially useful. Put 
put that on and also a little glue around where we so gluing that part on and then also um, adding a little glue let's see around the sections that we cut out just to kind of help clean that because it's still a little rough just from like the cutting and the drilling and the filing uh, and yeah, we can kind of extra glue, we can just kind of spread out around there uh, just to get that nice and clean. And that's crooked. There we go. That was weird. Just to get that all looking good. Uh, go ahead and just throw some glue on that and that'll just kind of, any roughness around there is just kind of melted back. Uh, are you going to paint it? Danzi asks. Yeah, eventually. Absolutely. I mean, this is a kind of kit that you certainly you know, like paint required kind of. Uh, Zaku Sniper appeared in Beginning G. That's interesting. Would not have known that. Uh, do you care for the grunt suits from any UC series? I mean, yeah, a lot of them. There's a lot of really great grunt suits. Uh, Rekondisa and G had, at least has Jagan have a cameo in the series. Yeah. Turne is UC as much as Rekondisa is UC as well. Yeah. Both of those, I mean, are uh, distant UC, right? This part is also probably better to cut out. It's going to be much more difficult to do that, though, just because it's such a tiny little part here. Probably going to leave this part B and not drill this one. But I don't know. I'm tempted. Mm, yeah, it's tempting. Because even if I drill out this, it's only, it's only going to go that much deeper, not really all that much. But we've started, so we're going to just have to do it, I think. I think my one millimeter drill is a little bit bent. It's kind of annoying. And also, yeah, I'm immediately regretting this because I'm already kind of messing it up a bit, but it's OK. It'll be fine uh, once it's all kind of, once it's all said and done. But I am messing it up a little bit. What's happening is that my drilling is not completely centered and it's kind of messing it up a little bit there but we'll work on this a little bit and get it right Hmm. My fear now is that I'm going to crack this whole part because it's such a tiny little piece. And I can already see it starting to crack. Or that's just from the knife blade. Oops. Uh, I use the Mr. Hobby set I have, but I bought the God Hand bits, and they really are worth the money if you have to do a lot of drilling. Are those, um, are the God Hand ones ones that it's like a, a single handle and you just have to swap out the, the bit? Because uh, I'm just now so used to being able to be very quick with this set in swapping between sizes. It would be kind of hard for me to go back to having to swap the bit every time. 
Oof, yeah, I really am making a mess of this part. But it's just going to take a little bit more cleanup. Should have not bothered with it, but what can you do? We'll get there. Uh, let's see. You do need to fiddle with swapping the chuck uh, for different sizes. Uh, just the bit itself. So you mean that like uh, just the the drill is like like the the bit itself is just like a higher quality one with the god hand set. I guess is probably what it would be, right? Uh, that it's kind of less work, less resistance, because you have a sharper drill bit, basically. That's the only thing that I could see like really being a, a useful advantage, right? Let's see. Quality is so nice. In my opinion, Ray Studio has the best Pin set, but I can't get that here. Oh, does he have like his own like brand one or something? I have a feeling that his would probably be. It's it's just like it's, it's the same. It's probably like from the same factory as like the God Hand one or something. It's just rebranded. I don't know for sure, but that would be my guess. Oof. Yeah, it's going to take a little bit to get this fixed up. Should not have bothered drilling this part, but oh well. I think it's getting there. It's almost presentable again. <laughs> so long as it looks good from the outside. Should not have put that away. Damn. All right, let's see. We're almost done with this part, I feel like. I'm going to get it as close as I can to, to looking good, and then we're just going to say... That's good enough. So it is just a little par here. I feel like if I keep messing with this, I'm just gonna really, I'm either gonna like break the part entirely or it's just gonna be like completely jacked up. So I need to quit while I'm somewhat ahead on this. But you never know. Or something interesting may happen, and I may love the look of this even more so. So now I'm kind of getting a little weird with this and doing something kind of a little different. 
I think that's going to be it for right now. Yep. I'll just go ahead and glue this on and we'll call it a day for this particular part anyway. Oof, yeah, it looks pretty rough. Ah, damn. I'm just going to want to keep messing with it though. Okay, let's glue it on. So, this part goes right about here. And should be a parallel. That okay. All right. Well, anyway, there it is. It's on there. <laughs> uh, uh, uh. What do you guys think about that part so far? We still have like eight more pieces to add just onto this front face mask like kind of part here. I keep calling it just a face mask, but you guys know what I mean. It's not at all a face mask. But... This part goes. Onto here. Actually, I'm going to do this. Mm, nope, I'm going to do this. Finding the exact right orientation for this little part is kind of difficult because it's not like just gluing it onto a flat surface. It's a curved surface, so there's kind of a specific way that it fits on there properly. There's not any good indicator to know exactly where that is. So that's kind of as good as any right there. Uh, let, the glue, let the glue dry? Yes. Gonna let some glue dry for reels. Next up. Okay, um, the other thing that I wanted to do uh, in the future and I suppose that any of you guys who are watching at the moment maybe not quite as interested in a video like this, but what I, I thought would be interesting, uh, maybe worth doing, is a sort of kind of introduction to Machine Krieger video. Where, I mean, like, I think Lincoln's done videos on that. Um, like he's done a video like what is Machine Krieger, but like, and I'm not like a super expert on it in general. But what I feel like a lot of people ask, like the question I get asked from time to time is uh, from people wanting to know like what's a good kiss to, to start out with. They're like they're feeling from people who are 
they think that the kits look interesting, but they're kind of not sure what would be a good kit to try out. So that's what I think uh, might be something interesting that I could kind of add to to that conversation is to like, uh, if you're interested in trying out Machine Krieger kits, here are a few that that would be good. And here are a few that would not be as good to try out uh, as like a beginner friendly ones and good introduction ones, something like that. That'd be something that you guys would agree could be useful and or interesting in some way. I'm actually surprised at how many parts are involved in this part of the kit, this section of the kit. I wouldn't have guessed just by looking at it. I would have guessed that more of this was just kind of all molded together. Definitely going to be some more gluing and stuff required on this later. So I think what I'm going to do, the next part of this has you putting like a bunch of little kind of like rivet sort of details onto there, which I think I'm going to leave off for the time being. So I'm just going to do this. Just marking on the manual, kind of circling these sections that need to be added later that I'm just not doing right now, just so I don't forget about it. Because, yeah, that's that. OK. Uh, you think it's a good idea for a video? Yeah. Uh, Alexander asks, how are you liking this kit? Yeah, I like it. Uh, let's see. Next part is right here. A5, A4. Are these easily distinguishable from each other? Yeah, they are like noticeably different. Okay. These parts here, which are, I believe it looks like they're like the arm sockets on the front. This is the, kind of like the, the front of the chassis, sort of, is what the next part of the build is. And there's what I could call like the arm sockets, essentially the section on here or that the arms plug into and there's these two bits which look very similar but they are slightly different so I don't really need to pay too close attention as to which one's which because then later when it's time to actually put them on to the kit they should be pretty easy should be pretty easy to tell uh, which is the right part and which is not so um, one thing that you'll see just from kind of oh and we forgot to put this part on there uh, this part for the interior of that goes into here. Um, do I want to put that on right now or wait? I think I can go ahead and put that on for right now. Well, let's see. I will just sand this a little bit or maybe not. Maybe not. I think it'll be fine. As I was saying, 
move some of this stuff to the side. And one thing that you'll notice, like kind of how uh, how it goes when when building these kits, is that there's kind of a lot of like backtracking, as in like you'll like these parts are parts that I had to put together, which kind of go inside for the legs, but I had to glue these. So I just wanted to put those together first, glue that, and then just kind of set it off to the side for a while. And then later, kind of as I'm progressing in the build, I'll bring those parts back and glue those on and like add more parts onto that. And there'll be like little sections or like little um, antennas or something like that, which then need to be added on um, later, kind of more towards the end of the build, like kind of right before you're ready to start painting. Uh, that kind of stuff, like the more kind of fragile bits that you kind of need to be a little bit careful of. You may not want it, or like really, really small parts, things like that, you kind of get to uh, later on. So you do a lot of backtracking, and it's kind of uh, reflected a bit in the way that the kits are painted as well. Uh, again, just kind of following the traditional aesthetic kind of, of how they're painted in that you have your ugly phase as it's lovingly referred to, which is kind of when you're first starting out and nothing really looks quite right and it doesn't really look like how it's supposed to. And that's kind of what you have uh, in the painting as well as like in the actual model build. So like yeah, now we're kind of in the ugly phase where it's nothing's really taking shape really quite yet. We're building a lot of stuff, but it doesn't really look like we're really doing anything just because we're building just kind of a lot of these little random sections. Uh, and then like kind of the next step is where it gets a little bit more refined. Everything kind of starts to come together and gets a little bit more cohesive once we start adding some of these sections together. And then in kind of the final step, again, kind of exactly like in the painting, you have like your final steps of the painting where everything gets like refined to being finished to where it's done. And again, the same thing. And then like when you're building it, the same thing is like I said, like little detail parts and antennas and springs and things like that are like kind of your last little bits that you add to kind of at the very end to kind of finish off the model. So you really thought about it like that, but yeah, it's interesting how, uh, the way the kits are built and the way that they're painted are kind of the same in that way. Anyway. Uh, how do you come up with designs for scribing? Well, I don't really do much scribing. Uh, so you're asking the wrong person on that, but I know that there are books. Uh, there's like whole books dedicated to kind of uh, learning about scribing techniques and uh, not just like the actual technique of doing the scribing, but um, the methodology kind of behind designing panel lines and things like that. So, I mean, if you're really interested, I'm sure there's other videos as well. Like you don't really necessarily need to purchase a book, but it's just one option if that's something that you wanted to do. Alternatively, yeah, I'm sure it's covered in lots of different type of YouTube videos and stuff. If you want to go way back to the Gumpla Talk days, uh, back when we were doing Gumpla Talk, I know that we did at least one episode uh, on that subject matter. So that's something you could check out. I'm sure other people have also covered it on their YouTube channels. And there's a lot of channels uh, probably that you'll see online, or I'm sure you've seen um, that do panel line scribing in their videos, but they maybe don't necessarily like teach much about the process. Well, like you can just kind of see by just watching, or you can learn by just watching what they're doing. They're not like really explaining too much about like, this is kind of how I came to the decision of making the line in this way and, you know, this is why I use this particular tool or not this other particular tool, something like that. Um, so if you're more interested in kind of the how and why 
aspect of it. I'm sure you can find uh, some videos on on that, but I'm not sure offhand which ones I could recommend really for that. So for this for right now, I know I'm going to sand more around on the surface of that. I'm just kind of sanding around the edges um, just because I want to make sure I'm kind of getting ready, getting rid of much of the mold line on the edge. I don't, as I was talking about earlier, I don't want to have like any kind of sharp edges that are a product of the mold along the edge, leaving a little bit of kind of sharp edge there. Uh, let's see. Any other questions that you guys have at the moment? I know for right now, it's just kind of, everything's just kind of going along. And it's very much just kind of piece by piece with these kits. Um, then we have uh, PCA we're going to need. Let's go ahead and pop these out. Yow, yow indeed. Uh, do you plan to get this kit? a cast finish. Oh, um, yeah. So that's what I was talking about earlier with like the, uh, with adding a texture to it with, um, uh, with putty. You can do it kind of like um, by hand painting, uh, hand painting the uh, primer and kind of putty mixture. Onto there, you can give it a kind of cast iron finish or uh, texture to it. And so, yeah, I know, I know that's something that Lincoln and, and many others uh, have done on this kit. And it's a fairly common uh, technique on this kit in particular, just because it really suits the design. So, yeah, more than likely, I will probably add some of that on there. Yes. Uh, I'm not exactly sure where or exactly sure how, as in like exactly kind of which way kind of I'll go about that technique, but yeah, I've done that before. I don't think I've done it for quite a long time though. I know one kit that I did do that on was I think like the very first time that I ever kind of really tried that technique was on the high mock. I think it's, is that what it's called? I don't even remember if that's the name of that kit. Is that right? The name of that uh, Build Fighters kit? Heimach, right? Is that... Kind of think of it. That kit has not been reprinted for a long time. Not that I've seen. Is that a kit that's been reprinted? Like, ever? I don't know. Seems like it's like a, a grunt kit that you would have thought Bandai would have tried to pump out like every now and then, like a new a new printing of that like quite frequently, but I don't know. It seems like it's been forever. Uh, are you planning on any more uh, Plamo No Trend live streams? Uh, yeah. Josh and I often talk about how we want to. Uh, yes, but um, it's just uh, scheduling that is much more difficult because he's been busy, I've been busy, and we're in much more different time zones now than we used to be. We used to be pretty close in terms of the time, though we were only like, I think, two hours different, something like that. Uh, but now it's obviously much more. And I know at the moment, uh, Josh is in Japan. So he's traveling. So I'm very envious of him. But he's been sending me updates and photos and stuff about what he's been doing there. And so he's having a really good time there, I know. I'm certainly jealous. But yeah, no, we, we would like to do some more Plum on the Trend someday. It's just kind of difficult to, to schedule it. But we will. I know Josh is also just kind of not 
that much interested in, in Gumpo that much anymore. It's like, fair enough. I mean, I'm sure he would still be interested enough to to do some Plamono trend to just look at some cool models. But I know like for him personally, like hobby wise, he's just kind of into other stuff recently. So yeah, text him or not text him, but like uh, add him on Twitter. Be like we want more Plamono trend. And yeah, if he knows that it's something you guys are wanting. Oops. There we go. Oh, interesting. Hmm. That fits right down into there. And this fits right into here. Oh, interesting indeed. That just pops right there onto that. Mm -hmm -hmm. That I feel like I'm not sure if that's right, but Mm. Spicy. Okay. That's cool. Yeah, give him a nudge. All right. So now we get to skip a bunch of stuff. So there's a part here where, once again, it's just adding a bunch of rivet details to this kind of, uh, if you guys can see that. All this, all this, up here, up here, that's, and that one, four, eight, 10, 12, onto the front of this part. We're gonna skip that for right now. Move on to this section, which is the interior, um, which is kind of interesting. 16. Hmm. Uh, okay. So this is this diagram is just showing how all the parts are ultimately going to look, but not exactly at this stage. So that's I'm looking at this thinking like, okay, we added these couple parts to the outside. And then the next step is just like add all this part, add every, all this to the inside. But no, that's actually more of just like the color guide here for you because actually the next couple of steps is where we're adding stuff onto the inside. So we can do that here back with runner A. Yes. Fourteen and fifteen. These go on the inside as well as a 19 and 20. As well as, let's see, A is for the next step, but since we're here, let's go ahead and cut this out. A12. And 
and a 16. Kind of knock out all of our parts for two sections at once here. So that's runner D. D, let's see, we need D 13 and a 7. Okay. 13. That's it for D, then, oh no, that's not D, 24. 24, and then C. C, C. Twenty one, twenty two, which are these parts right here. And C four. Okay. So that's everything that we need for the next two steps. Technically, uh, spams are stupid and sus Gundams are awesome. What? What is that about? I don't get what that's all about at all. Spams. Uh, although, since today's focus is non Gundam stuff, let's see, what's that? Can you remember when you first discovered Machine Krieger? Um, I'll answer your question first before I pose my question to you guys. But um, no, honestly, I don't remember. And I don't know what I would have seen. I, I feel like it was probably, uh, I don't know. I feel like it was probably on Pinterest or something weird like that, that like I, I had first kind of seen the designs possibly but I'm not sure. It's a good question. And I mean, yeah. I mean, I guess I just had kind of just seen them around. I know I, I like, I would have seen them like in Akihabara. That's, like in all, like realistically, that is probably the first time that I did see them was like seeing the store displays in Akihabara especially at Yellow Submarine. Uh, if you guys have ever been there or if you are uh, Machine and Krieger fans, you probably know about like the famous uh, displays of kits there at Yellow Submarine. Um, that probably would have been the first time I would have like actually ever seen the kits. Uh, and I probably saw them there before I really knew what they were. So that's why I, I don't really recall it as anything like really noteworthy because I, I probably just saw them and like didn't really think too much of it at the time because that would have been a kind of... Um, before I would have thought that they were anything that were that was really of too much interest to me. Does that make sense? Like if I had already known what they were, and I had ar and I was already, like, I already knew that, hey, those are kind of interesting. Then like seeing the display, there maybe would have made a greater impact. But because it was like just kind of something I was unfamiliar with, I'm sure I just kind of passed it, you know, fairly easily. Just like a, oh, that's cool, and then that's all. But, <laughs> uh. That's probably the first time that I would have ever seen them, really. I wonder if I have pictures from that time. I know I have pictures of like that display case from later, like later trips, but I don't think I do from like whenever I would have seen it the first time, which would have been 2009. Interestingly, uh, that's, I believe, around the time when Lincoln was kind of early in his days of, of working with the property. 
um, like I think it was like around the mid 2000s that he kind of gotten involved with Yokoyama san and, and Machine Krieger. Yeah, so I'm, I'm wondering if there would have been any of Lincoln's uh, models in that display at that time in 2009. I'd have to ask. Interesting. Wonder if the movie Ko was working on will ever happen. Yeah, I don't know. It was Les Koyokama working on it and someone trying to get one off the ground. What? What do you mean, Sturgetti? Sorry, I don't. I'm not following. But um, yeah, 2008 or 2009. Yeah, it would have been quite early on. I mean, like it's definitely something that's that's ticked up in popularity a lot since then. Like quite a lot, I'd imagine. At that time, I mean, even now, it's still like a pretty niche uh, segment of an already pretty niche hobby. But I mean, at that time, it would have been even more so. So I'm sure, it was very much not on my radar at the time. How does this go on here? Oh, OK, I like that. Gotcha. So those are fine. I don't think I need to cut that anymore to get that to be a closer fit. There's like some raised bits here. Let's see if cutting these will just make for a, a closer fit for these. Mm, yeah, kind of actually a little bit. That's nice. Um, a producer wants to make, oh, okay, about the movie, yeah. It was less uh, Koyokama working on it and so on trying to get one off the ground. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, right. That's what you were commenting on. Yes, the movie. Yeah. Producer wants to make the movie and has the okay, but that's only the first step making movies. So who who's the producer of that? Was it that uh, guy, vo that Voice Roberts guy, the same guy that wants to make the Metal Gear movie? Am I remembering that correctly or no? Um, as I know, uh, whether it's the same guy or not, I mean, just on the note of the of any potential Metal Gear movie, I know that that guy was like uh, in talks with uh, Hideo Kojima, and I don't know, like anyone else. I, I guess it's I, it would probably very be very difficult to do now because of what happened with the. Kojima and Konami, like rights-wise, I guess. But that'd be really cool. It sounded like from what I'd heard at the time that the guy was like quite serious about wanting to do like a really good, proper Metal Gear movie that was like very faithful and very much like working together with Kojima to to really make it like how he would envision it kind of thing, which seemed cool. But yeah, it's another thing that seems to have fallen by the wayside, along with the Gundam live action movie for that matter. Yeah. Uh, doo -doo -doo. That would be a good, I mean, I'll ask. I do like that question though, uh, just because I feel like I kind of know the story of how so many people who are into Gundam in like the Gumpla 
community, I kind of know how a lot of people, because for a lot of people, um, I know for a lot of them, they're similar to me in that they got into Gunpla through seeing it on Toonami. Uh, unless they're like some of the younger fans, and in that case, they probably got into Gundam and like Gunpla through seeing the anime, whether it be like um, Seed or Double O or IBO, one of those series. Or with Machine and Krieger, because it doesn't have that um, chance of exposure through an, an anime or anything like that, is kind of interesting to, to know more about kind of where people have heard of it from or kind of were first introduced. I don't remember because, I mean, like I said, I can take a couple of guesses. But yeah, I just really don't remember. But I don't know if it's somebody who's maybe kind of just been a little bit more recently kind of become aware of it. They they might recall that. So it would be interesting to know. Like if you guys have any interesting stories about kind of how you uh, originally kind of came across Machine Krieger, I mean, feel free to, to leave that there in the chat. But I think as long as I can remember to do so, I'll try to put up a post uh, on Facebook, or not on Facebook, uh, just on YouTube. I'll make like a post, a uh, community post later and ask people to kind of share their stories because I'm interested. I wonder some of you guys watching, other like watching now, or like I guess like some of my my audience, as, as in people who would see uh, my YouTube post and then reply on that. Some of them, or some of you possibly, uh, I have to imagine some of uh, some of those people or you people um, may have heard of Machine and Krieger through my channel originally or Lincoln or a combination of the two, one of the two, the Lincoln or me. Uh, but other than that, I'm wondering just kind of, uh, it's a good, in good, interesting question of how people came to know about Machine and Krieger. Hmm, interesting. Let's see. Now this does not fit. And well, it fits, but there's a little bit of a gap there. And I'm wondering why. Probably doesn't matter uh, at all. But just out of curiosity, I'm wondering why there's a little bit of a gap there. Putting this part in there doesn't fit quite right. There's nothing obvious, as in like a bit of flash or something sticking out somewhere that would kind of make that to be not fitting quite properly. But considering that this is on the inside, if visible at all, it's going to be very, very dark. And we're really only going to be kind of painting the highlights and kind of like the raised edges of sections like this. You don't need to worry too much about um, the fit being perfect. Right? Hmm. See, does the other side fit better? Just out of curiosity. Eh, it's about the same. Hmm. Okay. All right, fair enough. For me, SF3D for me and Hobby Japan 1984. I'm old, but I was in high school and I was able to uh, for a kit and fell in love. Wow, yeah, that's going way back. So yeah, that's you've certainly been on there for a while. Certainly not anything new. If you're going all the way back to the SF3D days. So yeah, like it would be just kind of interesting to know um, kind of, yeah, how many people have been Kind of fans for a long time or kind of fairly new fans. 
based on kind of what they've seen on YouTube, whether it be like from me or from Lincoln or other people on YouTube introducing the stuff. I also used to get the New Type magazine in English in the early 2000s. There you go. Uh, Lorenz, hey, good afternoon. Uh, looking, looking for modeling stuff online, yeah. Uh, being in my mid-30s, it was Toonami for me. Yeah, Toonami. I can't remember. Uh, let's see. I found it by looking up hand-painting lacquers because people swore you couldn't do it and found Link's old Barbatos video and was hooked on that sea pig. Yeah. Yeah, it was seeing uh, like Lincoln's early, like first first couple of videos. I So I guess it must have been that that's probably how I came across uh, Lincoln's channel was also looking up videos and like hand painting lacquers. And that must have been just like right at the right time that like that's when Lincoln was first. I mean, he must have only had like a couple of videos on YouTube at that time when I first came across his channel. And uh, yeah, I um, got to know him and yeah. What's well, a good way to clean uh, mold release for resin conversion kits? Just uh, warm soapy water really is kind of all that you need, but you can get like products that are specifically made for cleaning resin. But um, I, I would feel like uh, I think most people would probably would agree that you really kind of don't need anything like that. Yeah, I wish that those parts would have fit a little bit better, but that's okay. I don't even know if I'm going to have the cockpit open at all or not. So I won't worry too much about it at the moment. Uh, Purple Power, yeah, that's another one that I've heard uh, people use. I've, I've used it uh, kind of since moving, although I haven't really painted much resin i have um, a couple of things that are primed but now uh, i haven't uh, done much painting but that's what i've used to to clean the resin yeah is purple power just because that's what i've heard of from from other people in the us it's something that i haven't used that much uh and like Working re with resin in general is something that I've not um, worked on that extensively. I haven't worked, haven't done too much uh, resin work, so not really the best one to ask. But um, from my limited experience, uh, Purple Power was not available in Korea. So even though I, I had heard about it many times from friends in the US, uh, I had never used it until just recently just because it wasn't available. In Korea. I mean, I guess um, you could get it. And I think I had heard of people who had gotten some. There are other like expats living there, but it's not not very economical. There was like far more affordable options that you could get. You didn't really need to get something like that. All right, so the inside of our cockpit is coming together a little bit inside of this part here. Uh, have you already thought of a color scheme for this? No, not at all. Lorenz definitely haven't thought uh, anything that far ahead yet. Oh, actually, um, there's supposed to be two of this. Uh-huh. I thought it was kind of interesting that we have two of the D runner, but we're only using one set of this. I find it interesting that this L runner here, just on a side note, uh, this L runner, the 
parts are so shiny. It's like a gloss coat uh, or like a high gloss mold compared to like this, which is on the A runner. It's going to be really difficult for you guys to see, but can you see how much, like how much shinier this part is compared to this part? You can just see like kind of how it catches the light. You can see the difference between the. So I don't know how or why that happened. This L runner, I guess, I'm guessing is a later mold from something different. Uh, but I'm not sure. Anyway, yeah, it's very different. It's like really, really noticeably different. The finish on that, so interesting. I think I'm going to wrap up the stream here in just a couple of minutes. And we're going to call it a day. But yeah, obviously, still a lot more work to be done on this build. But probably, I mean, a couple of days, like a couple of sessions like this, um, more of work and it's kind of essentially going to be all put together for the most part um these bills i mean maybe one of like the smaller safs uh kind of suit kits you could put together like all in one sitting and it basically be done but i mean it would take you like a good portion of the day just because again some areas need to be glued and so you would have to like come back to those and uh, but not the type of kit that you can sit down and just finish in a single sitting very easily. These machine career kits, especially one of the larger suits like this. Um, but yeah, like I said, that's one of the things that I enjoy about building these is that you can really slow down and, and take your time with them uh, so much more so than you can like with Gundam kits. So uh, I've noticed that too on a few of them. Not sure why though. Yeah, the uh, the high gloss. Yeah, I don't know. Strange. Um, but yeah, I think I'm gonna call it a day for right now. Um, I don't know if I'll do another live stream building this kit. Maybe once it gets like maybe like the I'll skip a session. So like the next session is will be kind of more of this kind of basically this more of the same what I've been doing. Kind of just like kind of the general construction of things. There's there's some. Uh, uh, sanding and everything, and then maybe some more putty or gluing required for some of the parts that we had to glue the seams on. And then maybe I'll do another live stream for like the like the last part of the build, kind of showing some of like the last bits that are kind of adding some of the small parts and like the detail parts, and then maybe any sort of like customization that we might want to do at that time, like adding other little details or things like that, or subtracting details or whatever the case may be. Uh, maybe we'll do that as a live stream uh, later on once the kind of general construction is all taken care of. But for now, I think you guys kind of get the, you get the gist of kind of uh, how the basic construction process goes on these kits. So yeah, hopefully that was interesting, something different. Um, it's not the first time I've ever done a live build of a machine career kit, but uh, of the Mark 44, it's my first time building one and it's, it's a fun build so far. So yeah, thank you guys for hanging out. Uh, come and hang out on my birthday. Appreciate it, you guys. Thank you so much uh, for all your support every day. We have the um, Daryl Balde, HG Daryl Balde review uh, coming up will be the next review. But yes. I'm just finishing up right now. OK. <laughs> Anyway, uh, yeah, so that's going to be it for today, guys. And I'm not sure what the next live stream build will be, which would be just kind of like a normal live stream build. Uh, but there will be something else in between. And then, um, yeah, I'll maybe probably likely do another live stream build of this kind of later on in the process, uh, so maybe like next week or something. But I'll let you guys know. Anyway, thank you so much, and uh, I'll catch you next time. Bye-bye.